From Hollywood, California, Chapter 5 of the Chronicles of River's End. The star of the show, Gene Herschold, in his greatest of all roles. The title of the show, Dr. Christian. The sponsor of the show, the Cheeseboro Manufacturing Company, owners of the trademark, Vaseline. These programs, which bring you the outstanding Hollywood star, Gene Herschelt, in the role of the wise and kindly small-town doctor, which he has made famous, are presented every Sunday afternoon to remind you of one of the most widely known home remedies in the world, Vaseline Petroleum Jelly. Don't neglect any skin abrasion, no matter how slight. Wash it immediately under running water and apply Vaseline Jelly. It costs only 10 cents a bottle anywhere in the United States, so there is no reason for any family to be without this standard first aid product. We take you now to Dr. Christian's office, where he and his friend Roy Davis, the druggist, are spending a quiet evening over a game of checkers. Well, go ahead, Roy. It's your move. Yes, yes. Now, let's see here. There. <laughs> You walked right into a trap. There goes your king. Yes. There goes your whole game. (laughs) (laughs) I guess you're right, Roy. You know, Doc, you get as much fun out of losing as you do out of winning. Oh, why not? It's only a game. If you lose, you can always start out and try it again. Want to play another? What time is it? Oh, it's early. 25 minutes after 10. All right, I'll go you another. Uh, Did you ever play with Ed Meadows? Mm-hmm. Say, if he loses, it spoils his whole evening. Yeah. To hear him, you'd think a game of checkers was a matter of life and death. Well, I suppose that's only human nature. We think the things we do are important just because we are doing them. Mm. Want to play with the black or the white this time? I'll well, stick with the black. They're lucky. Well, now take the two of us. There we are, having a friendly game of checkers. A nice, quiet evening with no interruption, and yet I'll bet that... Yeah, I spoke too soon. Mm. Dr. Christian. Why, Frank. Can he come over to the hotel right away? The man in room 14. I think he's killed himself. Say, Roy, don't you think Dr. Christian has been up in room 14 an awful long time? What's he doing? I don't know, Frank. But he's doing everything that can be done. You can count on that. If there's a chance at all of saving him, Doc will bring him out of it. Do you think there is a chance? Well, if there is, I'd say it's pretty slim. He seems such a nice young fellow, too. Not like a man to do a thing like that. Why, at first I thought he was asleep, just like Amelia did. And then I saw how pale he was. And that bottle. What was in the bottle? It was poison, all right. Oh, it's terrible. Did he take much of it? If the bottle was full, he took enough. I was afraid to telephone to Doc, afraid somebody might come in the lobby and hear me talking. If the news got out, he wouldn't do the hotel any good. How long after he took the stuff did you find him? I couldn't say when he took it. It was about a quarter after six when he registered. He said he'd come in on the six o'clock bus from St. Paul. That's funny. What? Six o'clock bus doesn't come from St. Paul. Anyway, that's what he told me. And he registered from St. Paul. And I showed him up to his room. And that's the last I saw of him until Amelia called me. Well, did he say anything when he registered? Anything special? No. No, he, he didn't have any luggage, so I told him I'd have to charge him in advance. And he said that'd be all right. He didn't talk like a man who was planning to, well... Timmons. Yes? He's... he's going. Poor devil. You think I'd better go up? I wouldn't. There's nothing you can do. Well, you might as well get to bed, Amelia. I'll stay up if you'll need me. I, I don't mind. Oh, no, it's after midnight. You go ahead. Good night. Good night. Good night, Amelia. Well, I suppose he wanted to die. I wonder why. I wonder who he is. Why, his name's John Blake. I thought I told you. That isn't his name. But he signed the register. I know, I know. But Blake isn't his name, and he didn't come from St. Paul. I'd swear to it. I'll tell you something else, too. Doc asked me to go through his pockets to see if I could find any letters or anything that had his address on it. You know, in case we'd want to notify his home about him. Yeah? Well, there weren't any. He didn't have a thing in his pockets except some money. Now, that's kind of peculiar in itself. Most men will have a bill fold or cards or something. Yes, that's right. Then I started to look for laundry marks on his clothes, figuring if the worst came to the worst, we could get a line on him that way. Well, there weren't any laundry marks either. 
Even the label inside his coat had been ripped off. You mean you think... I think he wanted to make sure we'd never discover who he was. I don't see why he'd go to all that trouble to fool us. Maybe it wasn't us he was trying to fool. Maybe it was someone else. Frank, that fellow was afraid of something. Running away from something. Something that he feared even more than death. What do you suppose it was? I don't know. There's not much chance of finding out. No. Yes, I guess it's just one of those things that never, never will be... Oh, boy. Yeah, boy. Yes, Doc, huh? Yeah. Oh, I call up Mrs. Stone and tell her I have a nurse in job for her right away. What? I want her for the night... For all night. Or maybe longer. Ask her to bring a suitcase. Well, Doc, I thought that you... I haven't time to talk now. I've, I've got to get right back. Doc, you have... He isn't... He's going to live. <laughs> I'll be there in a moment. Oh, Dr. Well, Mr. Blake. What are you doing here? I told you to stay in bed another day. Yes, I, I know, but... Oh, come in. I hope I didn't get you out of bed. No, I, I was reading. I came to tell you I'm all right. I'm leaving in the morning. Going back to work in the lumber camp. The lumber camp? Yes. But I... I don't know whether that would be wise... You've been pretty sick. You ought to stay here and rest for a little while. Get your strength back. No, I, I've got to leave in the morning. I, I wanted to have a little talk with you first. To pay my bill. Oh, yes. Sit down, will you? Thank you. In the first place, about that poison I took. You understand, of course, it was a mistake. Yes. I'm sure it was a mistake. An overdose, that's all. No doubt the ethics of your profession make what I'm about to ask unnecessary, but you... You won't mention this to anyone? No, of course not. I'd regard it as a favor if you'd forget all about the incident. Forget you'd ever seen me. Now, about your fee, how much do I owe you? Five hundred dollars. Sorry, but I haven't that much cash on me. Oh, that's all right. I'll take a check. I think Judy keeps my check book in this drawer. Yes, here it is. Oh, you can just write in the name of your bank if... That's satisfactory. Yes, that'll be all right. Oh, I... I don't believe I know your first name. Paul. Dr. Paul Christian. Wait a minute. If, if you don't mind, I'd rather send you the money. Oh, suit yourself. I'll mail you a bill in a few days. Where will you be? What lumber camp? Why, well, I'll be at... I, I haven't decided yet, I... I have several offers. Well, then maybe we better just make out the check now. I, I'd rather not. Why? Well, I, I make it a rule always to pay cash. I've made a banking connection. You see, I... Why don't you give the real reason? If you sign John Blake's name to a check, it would be fictitious. There isn't any John Blake. I don't know what you're driving at. I am John Blake. And you're a lumber man? Yes. Hmm. Look at your hands. You haven't done one day's manual work in your life. I asked you $500 as my fee, and you don't even question it. To a lumberjack, $500 is a fortune. Well, I didn't stop to think. I see you didn't. Nor stop to get the name of a lumber camp to make your story ring true. Before you leave, it seems to me that you have a number of things to explain. Or would you rather tell your story to the police? Well, this is ridiculous. You'll get your money tomorrow. Good evening, Dr. Christian. Hello? Hello? Wait a minute. Hello? I'll stay. But I don't know what you're driving at. I haven't any story to tell. Well, then perhaps I can tell it. I came across something in the Chicago paper the other day. Oh, just by accident, only a few lines. But it mentioned that a young man by the name of Bruce Harwood had been missing for three days. Well, what about it? Oh, I think I can guess what happened to him. He came to River's End, an out-of-the-way little town. He registered at a hotel under the name of John Blake. He had been very careful to remove from his clothing all marks which might serve to identify him. But he overlooked one thing, a signet ring with the initial B.H. It tallies pretty well, doesn't it, Mr. Mr. Harwood? I presume you're very proud of figuring that out. Very proud of saving my life. Well, you needn't be. I hadn't expected to encounter an amateur detective or a doctor who didn't know when to, when to leave well enough alone. I don't think you'll do it again. Oh, 
Yes, I will. Quicker the next time. I know how easy it is. <laughs> it's been very funny. I made a botch of life, and now I'm even prevented from dying successfully. Oh, no. You haven't made a botch of life. Life is too big for you or anyone else to make a botch of it. Well, my own life, then. How can you tell? You haven't lived enough of it. I lived enough of it to know it's a dark welter. Without purpose, without justice. You're like a person who stands in front of a great painting which is covered by a curtain and sees only a tiny portion of it through a little tear on the cloth and says to himself, huh, there's no beauty here, no pattern, only chaos. I've heard all those arguments before. I don't want to be preached at. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know anything about me. Oh, on the contrary. I know a great deal about you. Why, you are a young man who's had an excellent education, a considerable amount of money, perhaps a position in society. Are those important and... enough to live for? No. You haven't seen the things important enough to live for yet. They're still covered by that curtain. It has to be torn aside. Those are simply words. Empty. They haven't any significance. Oh, I suppose you mean well enough. But it's no use. I've gone over this and over it and over it. And there's no other way out. Tell me about it, son. Well, why not? You might find it amusing. You were partly right about my having money. The Howards have been eminently successful. Empire builders, merchant princes, that sort of thing. I was raised on success stories. Well, after college, my uncle put me in charge of the Chicago branch of the business. Well? I couldn't make a go of it. I didn't dare to tell him that. No Howard ever failed. So I took the firm's money and gambled with it. Well, not for myself. I, I wanted to show a profit for the firm. For a while, I, I did. Then I began to lose. Got in deeper. Well, you can guess the rest of it. They probably found me out by this time. You know how it'll look to them, that I'm a thief. And so you came here and registered at the hotel. Yes. And you should have let me die. Why didn't you? Oh, you can always take that way. I have another suggestion. If it doesn't work, well, you're no worse off than you were before. I'm not going back and face them. No, no, it isn't that. Come in tomorrow morning and I'll tell you about it. But what is it? Not now. You're tired. In the morning you'll see things much more clearly. You won't tell anyone who I am? No, I won't. Come in early, about, oh, about five o'clock, before anybody is around. Will you do that? Well, all right. I'll be here. Vaseline Hair Tonic performs two vital functions for your hair. First, it lubricates and cleanses the scalp. If you apply it directly to the scalp and rub it in briskly with the fingertips and then shampoo with any mild soap, you will find your hair cleaner than ever before. Because the tonic loosens the dirt that collects in everybody's hair and scalp. The sooty air of our cities and the dusty air of our country deposits dirt on your hair and scalp just as it does on your face. Women know that cold cream will take off this unwelcome dirt from the face without irritating the skin. Well, Vaseline Hair Tonic does exactly the same non-irritating cleansing job for your scalp. So get a bottle tomorrow and use it every time you shampoo your hair. The function of Vaseline Hair Tonic is to help you keep your hair well-groomed, neat, always in place. Brush a few drops on each morning and your hair will look well throughout the entire day. A 40-cent bottle of Vaseline Hair Tonic will give you many weekly shampoos as well as daily groomings. We believe you'll agree it is an inexpensive way to keep your hair looking its best. We return now to our story of Dr. Christian of River's End as played by Gene Hersholt. The scene, a stretch of country road paralleling the river. Through the cold gray fog of early morning looms a pair of automobile headlights. Yes, the mornings are pretty crimpy this time of the year. Special down here where you get the mist off of the river. <laughs> Road's kind of bumpy, isn't it? Yes. They ought to do something about those chuck holes. But then there's so few people live out this way that I suppose it isn't worth spending the money. Isn't it? Ah, uh, the land is hard to worth farming. But the people seem to get along all right. Now take the Jenks's, the place where we are going. George works in the lumber camps most of the year, and Mrs. Jenks and a hired man runs the farm. 
suppose when the boy is older, Will you then... please tell me the purpose of all this? What are we doing? Well, I have already told you. I have to make a call and get back to the office. It's a long way, so I, I had to start early. Why am I alone? Well, I didn't think you had anything else to do. Well, I have. I have an appointment. And this time I intend to keep it. Last night, I almost believed what you told me. That you had another way out. I see now you were stalling. All you have is a nice little set of phrases. You can't do anything. You can only talk. No. I'm afraid I can't do anything. Then why did you lie to me? Why don't you let me alone? Oh, I know the answer. You think if you can stall long enough, I'll lose my nerve. You think you can persuade me to go back, humiliate myself, do a term in prison. You'd have a nice little moral victory to your credit, wouldn't you? No doubt you'd get a lot of smug satisfaction out of it. Well, you're due to be disappointed. I haven't lost my nerve. I'm going through with it. It's better not talk so loud. Here we are. I'm going through with it right now. There's the river over there. It's as good a way as any. Wait. Let loose a bit. Will you listen a moment? I've listened to you too long already. By now they found out about me. They'll be trying to trace me. Let loose, I Don't be you. a coward. What difference what I am? I don't want to hit you. But I'll have to if you don't let me. Oh, only listen to me. I can't get you to do this. I'm responsible for you. All right, I absolve you from the responsibility. But I brought you out here. Mr. Timmons at the hotel knows that you came with me. I've got to bring you back. Oh. Who's the coward now? So you're afraid. Afraid something will happen to hurt your precious reputation. You should have thought of that before you tried to interfere. I'm sorry, Dr. Christian, but this time you're not going to be able to stop me. Wait, wait. Listen. What difference would a few minutes make? All I'm asking you is to go back to town with me. You're stalling again. No, no. You'll get me in town and turn me over to the police. If I'd wanted to turn you over to the police, I could have done it last night. After all, my intentions were good. You could do me this one favor. Be a little generous. Why should I do a favor for you? Or for anyone? What favors have I received? How generous has life been to me? I won't argue with you. I'm only asking you to wait for just a little while. How long will you be in this house? An hour, not more than that. And it's it's, it's early, only a, only a little after five o'clock. We can we can be back again in town by six thirty. Uh, you want me? You want you want to leave this morning? You can you can still leave. And you won't try to stop me? No, no. Or phone anyone about me from the house? On my honor. I'll go in with you. Come on. Oh, Dr. Christian, I was afraid you weren't coming. I'm a little late. I stopped for a friend of mine, a Mrs. Jenks, Mr. My name is John Blake. I'm glad to know you, Mr. Blake. Are you a doctor? No. Uh, but I thought the case might interest him, Mrs. Jenks. Oh, doctor, do you think everything is, is all right? Oh, I'm sure of it. After all these years, I couldn't stand it now. If... There's nothing to worry about. In a few minutes, we... Well, hello there, young man. Hello, Dr. Christian. I thought I heard your voice. <coughs> Spot, stop that barking. It's only Dr. Christian. Yes, Spot, you should be ashamed of yourself. Come here. There's someone else, though, isn't there? It's Mr. Blake, dear. Dr. Christian's friend. Oh, hello, Mr. Blake. How do you do? Well, Bobby, how do you feel this morning? I feel swell, Dr. Christian. Oh, that's fine. Have you and Mr. Blake had breakfast, Doctor? No, but uh, we leave when we get back to town. Mr. Blake is in a little hurry. I could make you some coffee. No, no, thank you. Just get Bob ready and bring him back here. In this room? Not the bedroom? Oh, this room is as good as any. How do you want me to get ready, Dr. Christian? What do you want me to do? Well, you might wash your face. Come on, Spot. And while you're at it, Bobby, wash behind your ears. Okay. Oh, Mrs. Jenks, yes. it might be a good idea to have a basin of warm water handy. I'll heat some right away, Doctor. All right. Who are these people? The Jenkses. Don't you remember me telling you? Mrs. Jenks runs the farm and her husband works in the lumber camps. That's why he isn't here. I've often wondered how the other half lived. To sing this hovel, I understand. They don't. They're very poor. Can you imagine why anyone living in circumstances like these would want to go on living? What incentive is there? What reason? Nothing but a biological urge to hang on to life, no matter what it does to you. That's a cruel doctrine. But it's true. What's the matter with the boy? He's blind. Oh. He's been blind from birth for 14 years. But he, he seems quite cheerful. Yes. He's never known anything else. He's lived always in darkness. Yet in a certain fashion, I suppose he sees. Probably clearer than many of us. 
I noticed you realized there was someone else in the room. That's what I mean. There's a kind of vision which doesn't depend upon our eyes, which permits us to see in spite of the darkness. When we lose that, we are very blind. I thought the bandage around his eyes was, well, something temporary. It is. Robert was born with congenital cataract, something only an operation could remedy. Rather an expensive operation because it couldn't be performed here. And as I told you, the Jinxes are very poor. But they wanted the boy to see. For 14 years they lived for that, sacrificed, saved what little money they earned. Last week I took Robert to the hospital in the city. And was the operation? Well, we'll know this morning. That's why I came here. To remove the bandages. To tear aside that curtain which has been hanging over that great painting I spoke of. You might have been more merciful to leave the curtain as it is. Use the water, Doctor. Or just put it on the table there. How's my face look now, Dr. Christian? Well, oh, you've done a very nice job. Aha, uh -huh, behind your ears, too. Say, Dr. Christian, can Spot stay here and watch? Why not? Now, you sit down here in this chair, Robert, and face in the window. Shall I pull down the shade, Doctor? No, the morning light is very soft. Now, sit still, Robert. This isn't going to hurt a bit. I'm just going to take off the bandages. I'm not afraid, Dr. Christian. But, gee, I'm excited. Lean back in the chair. That's right. Oh, Doctor. There. It isn't... It isn't going to work. He can't see. Mother... Mother, I, I can see, I can see, I can see your face, Mother. Oh, for the first time, for the first time. Oh, Bobby, Here, Bobby, here, Bobby. why is everybody so sad? This will never do. Look, Robert, her spot. Oh, spot. <laughs> Yay, gee, you're swell. I didn't know you had a mark around your eye. And here's the room you've lived in. Oh. It's beautiful. Let me touch things. I can see them, can't I? The table. And the big chair where Dad sits when he's home. What are those things in the box, outside the window? Geraniums, dear. They're dead now. You see, the frost killed them. But they're so pretty. Dr. Christian? Yes? What's that? In the sky? Why, that's dawn breaking. The beginning of a new day. Dawn? That's dawn. I've heard about it, only I, I didn't think it would be like this. So beautiful. It's like, like I dreamed heaven might be. Is it this way every day? Yes. Oh, Dr. Christian, the world is wonderful, isn't it? Yes, Robert. Wonderful. Christian's office? Yes. Oh, yes, Jerry. I'm just ready to leave. Yeah, sounds swell. I'd love to. In about two minutes. <laughs> Goodbye. Say, look here, young lady. Seem to meet that young so man. Good Dr. Christian. I'll see you in the morning. <laughs> oh, hi, Roy. Hello, Judy. Hello, Doc. Oh, hello, Roy. Where have you been all day? I phoned a half a dozen times. Judy told me you were still out. Yes, I had to go out to the Jenks place to take the bandages off Robert's eyes. How is the boy? He's just fine. Sees as well as you do. <laughs> Maybe better if the way you play checkers is any indication. <laughs> is that so? I can beat you any day in the week. Yeah. This is no place for me if you men are going to start in on that interminable game again. I'll be in early tomorrow, Dr. Christian. All right, Judy. Have a good time. Good night. Good night. Good night. Now then, Roy, today I'm lucky. 
Want to try it? Well, you'll be playing with dynamite, Doc, but you've asked for it. You get out the checkerboard. Now, what did I do with it the last time I beat you? Huh? Huh? Oh, here it is. Here it is. Now, just sit down and relax. This is going to hurt a little. <laughs> you want the red or the black? I'll take the black. Well, black will be just the proper color when I get through with you. Hmm. Say, uh, whatever became of the young fellow at the hotel? John Blake? Now, that wasn't his right name. Well, whatever it was, he had a change of heart. Decided the world wasn't such a bad place after all. After he'd seen it through somebody else's eyes. Well, how do you mean, Doc? He was with me when I took the bandages off the Jenks boy. Gave him something to think about. This afternoon he made up his mind to go back home. What was the matter with him, anyway? Oh, he'd had a few business reverses, that's all. It's so silly to take anything like that seriously. Why, it's just a game. If you lose, you can always start all over again. Like checkers, eh? Yes, like checkers. Hmm? Trouble is, we think the things we do are important just because we are doing them. Say, it seemed to me that I saved that someplace before. You did. Oh, that's where I heard it. Now, go ahead. You will move. And so we leave Dr. Christian playing a well-earned game of checkers with Roy Davis. And return the microphone to Art Gilmore, playing the question-and-answer game with Judy Price. Only this time you ask the questions, Art, and let me give the answer. Very well, Judy. Explain to me and the radio audience just what Vaseline petroleum jelly really is. Well, in the first place, the word Vaseline is a registered trademark owned by the Cheese Bureau Manufacturing Company and used by them to identify their large group of medicinal and toilet preparations. But where did it come from? Robert A. Cheesebro, founder of the business, coined it. When the first oil well was sunk in 1859, he became one of the pioneer manufacturers of oil products. And was he the first to make petroleum jelly? Yes, through a special process of distilling and filtering. Vaseline jelly is odorless, absolutely uniform in color, purity, and melting point. And it's made without the use of chemicals. And a jar or tube of Vaseline jelly purchased in New York and one purchased in Cape Town are exactly the same as to content? Exactly. All Vaseline products are manufactured with the same degree of scrupulous care, are sterilized in the process of manufacture, and packed in sterilized containers. Well, what can people who have to stand on their feet a great deal do to relieve the tired, aching foot muscles? A hot foot bath at night followed by a massage with Vaseline jelly is very restful. It helps you avoid calluses and chapped heels, too. Well, Judy, here's the last question. How can I keep a friend of mine from walking in his sleep? And here's the last answer. Get him a bicycle. <laughs> the prices of Vaseline preparations mentioned on this program apply only in the United States. When you purchase any Vaseline product, be sure to look for the trademark Vaseline on the package. If you don't see it, you are not getting the genuine article. Join us again next Sunday afternoon at this hour when the makers of Vaseline preparations again present Gene Hersholt, one of the foremost stars of Hollywood, in the role of Paul Christian, the doctor of River's End. And by the way, if you haven't seen Heidi, the current 20th Century Fox hit, in which Gene Hersholt appears with the world's most engaging child, Shirley Temple, you have a treat ahead of you. Gene Hersholt appears on this program through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox. This is Arthur Gilmore bidding you good afternoon for the makers of Vaseline Preparations. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.